Well, good morning. I am Pastor Kim Peterson. I serve Good Hope Lutheran Church in Titanka and parish three Lutheran churches in Woden, Iowa. This Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday. It is February the 14th. It is also Valentine's Sunday. So happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Some announcements to lift up. Uh, first of all, Ash Wednesday begins this week. And uh, so the first Ash Wednesday service will be at Good Hope. I am using a series about the eyes with Jesus, and this first week will be misjudging eyes. Installation service for Parish 3 Council was supposed to be today, and we will do that next week. And then next week is 9 a.m. worship at St. John's. Leona Schmidt will be 101 years old. We are asked to send cards to her in care of the Titanka Care Center. So... 101. <clears throat> at Good Hope, on Tuesday at 9 o'clock, they'll be getting together to piece together quilts. And then Ash Wednesday service is at 7 o'clock at Good Hope. And then next week, we'll be back to our regular schedule, Sunday school at 9.15 and worship at 10.30. At Good Hope, we are in need of someone to attend the online Synod Assembly meeting on April 10th. Um, our, usually our, good, our Synod Assembly takes place someplace like uh, Sioux City, or if we're fortunate out here up at uh, Spencer, which you, either way it amounts to our having to travel, usually have to get hotel rooms, and sometimes for some people have to take time off from work on Friday to be able to attend the Assembly. <clears throat> this year, the Assembly will be online and on Friday the 9th. You, there will be training session for uh, doing the Zoom. They are having to do something a little different than what we're used to so that people can vote and so that uh, people can speak as they want to. So uh, if you are normally not able to travel to attend our Senate Assembly, please consider doing this. Uh, and uh, you will need a computer, be it a laptop or an iPad of some kind uh, that will be your only need. And if there's a problem with that, let me know and maybe we can figure something out. Services are being, uh, will be on YouTube. So you can go to the Good Hope Lutheran Church, Titanka, and see it on YouTube. And likewise, I will be sending it to the Titanka Burt Communications and it will be on the cable television. And again, a happy Valentine's Day to everyone. We have to be legal. We want to be uh, in our service. Uh, we don't want to abuse our ability, our, what we can do here and uh, doing things online. So we have a subscription to Sundays and Seasons, which gives us copyrights to use the liturgy, to reprint the Bibles for the lessons and uh, them using the lectionary and the graphics are from free clip art. Today, our service then is being done online. We wrestle a great deal with whether to cancel services or not. And we finally determined that if the weather were gonna hold true and looking at 40 to 45 degree below weather with the wind chill, that maybe we're better off just to take advantage of being able to do the service online as we are doing here now. So I'm sorry for any inconvenience, but uh, we pray that everyone is warm and safe today. Let us begin our service then with a brief order of confession and the good news that is the forgiveness of our sins. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we take a couple minutes or a few moments, I should say, and reflect on our life with our neighbor and also then our life with God. We use the Ten Commandments to do that. And then we prepare to make our confession.
let us confess. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now the absolution, that is, hear the good news that Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for today is from 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. In these verses, we have two things that are happening that are kind of interesting to watch. First of all, we have Elijah, who will transition, you could say, from, from Elijah, who's been the, the prophet, and now it will, the, the prophet office of prophet will be transferred to Elijah. But as you read through this, you'll see that Elijah is a very reluctant, even a grumpy uh, person. Every time they go someplace and the company of prophets, probably the student prophets maybe, or, or prophets who were under Elijah, they would come out and they say, hey, do you know that today the, your master is going to be taken away from you? And he would say, yes, keep silent. In other words, kind of a nice way of putting the Bible of, of uh, saying, shut up. But it's kind of interesting to read through this and see this repeating. Also, as I read this story, I often wonder what the experience was for Elijah as he was taken up into heaven. What did he see? What did he feel? What did he experience? Now, that had to be uh, quite a thing. And maybe someday we'll find out. So we read. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, as, for the, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elijah, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elijah, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elijah said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Now 
He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. <clears throat> and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. From Psalm 50, beginning with verse 1. The Mighty One, God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its settings. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. <clears throat> Our gospel reading for this Transfiguration Sunday is from Mark chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, taking them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Here ends the reading of the Gospel of our Lord. As I read today's lessons, I thought a lot about transitions. You know, Elijah and Elijah, there was a transitioning of the office of the prophet. And Jesus, as he is transfigured, we have a transition from his ministry as he's been doing it to be going towards the cross. But what about us? How does God prepare us for our transitions in life and how does he help us? Well, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now transitions are never easy or seldom are they easy. Transitions usually mean change. Well, how does God prepare you and I for the transitions in life? Well, you know, you look at things, and in many ways, we spend a lot of time preparing for our transitions. We go to grade school, and that prepares us to transition into middle school and then high school. And then after high school, we might transition to college or technical school maybe to the military, and some young people transition into marriage and family right away. In our later years in life, we try to prepare for our transitions as we look towards retirement. We realize that we need to take better care of our bodies all of a sudden, so we try to lose weight and exercise a little bit, and we are working at saving money and, and making investments so that will be able to retire comfortably. But not all transitions can be planned for. So we try to practice good stewardship in our lives and the, using the gifts that God has given us so that we can prepare for transitions and also knowing that in faith that God will help us through those changes in life. John the Baptist brought us the message to prepare for the transition of the coming of the Savior. 
He come out of the wilderness and he said, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And people were being baptized by him, a baptism of repentance. And then Jesus comes and he baptized Jesus. And when Jesus uh, come up out of the waters, the heavens were torn open. It's interesting to look at this, the deliberate use of the word torn. And as they are torn open, the, the, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. And he hears the words from, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus was being prepared now to begin his ministry, to transition from being whatever he was in life before to doing the specific ministry that he was sent to do. So he went out into the, the communities and he healed the sick. He cast out demons and he proclaimed the good news telling people that the kingdom of God was near. And the day came then when it was time to prepare for another transition. In Mark 8, these words that take place just before the transfiguration, the six days before. And Jesus is sitting with the disciples and he's teaching them. And he says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And then Jesus talks about another transition that comes with him. And that comes... That's the transition for those of us who follow him, that we will be expected to do the same as he is doing. So he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So now for those who follow Jesus, we have the challenge as our lives we transition from being our old sinful selves to following jesus we deny ourselves to care for our neighbor we pick up our crosses which is picking up the suffering of others to make it our own and then we lose our life for the sake of jesus and the gospel now six days later jesus goes up to the mountaintop and he takes with him peter and james and john he was transfigured before them Right before their eyes, they saw a side of Jesus that they knew was there, but yet they didn't quite grasp. So even his earthly clothes became whiter than white, a heavenly white. And then there's more to see. There's Elijah and Moses with him talking. Moses. Why Moses? Moses was the great leader who led the people of Israel through the transition from being an Egyptian uh, captivity or bondage to cross the Red Sea, to go through the wilderness to the promised land. <clears throat> it was with Moses that the Passover took place, the Passover that the people of Israel practiced every year, even today they practice it. <clears throat> so Moses also gave the, the law, the Ten Commandments, and the various other laws that went with that. So he was very important in the establishment of Israel and uh, being God's people. Elijah was the great prophet, and he comes during a time when there is rebellion against God. And his, his task was trying to turn people back to God. He took on the, the false prophets of the false gods, Baal, and uh, he challenged the king, Ahab, and and uh, he also spoke with God. And Elijah was expected to return to prepare the way for the promised Messiah. So that's why they thought John was possibly uh, the uh, Elijah. Well, Peter is so shook and so excited in all of this <clears throat> that he can't figure out what to say or do. So he says, let's build three booths here. And there'll be markers of what happened here and, and, you know, in reality, then people would be able to return to this spot and worship Jesus in a special, unique way, because this is where they saw Jesus as God. So this sounds crazy, but, you know, we still do that today. In the Lutheran Church, we don't, but the Roman Catholic has places, the Roman Catholic Church has places like this. One example is Our Lady of the Lords. It's an interesting little history here. 
back in 1858, a young girl and her sister were, were gathering firewood in the vicinity of Lourdes in France. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, appeared to her. It was the first of 18 apparitions. And at one of those apparitions, Mary told this little girl to dig into the ground to reveal a spring. At first, the water was kind of muddy as it came out, but then it became clear and, and very pure. This water then became, this place became the focal point of many pilgrimages with people from 1858 to today coming to the Lord's to drink of the water of that spring, possibly to bathe in it with the hopes of being healed. And evidently there are some people that are healed. I don't, I don't know, but that's what I've read a little bit. So can you imagine if Peter had built those three booths? Instead of worshiping the crucified and resurrected Christ, we would be going to this place and we would be maybe building churches or shrines and never and leaving our focus on Jesus to be just there on the mountaintop. This is not a place for worship. It is a place of transition. Once again, a cloud overshadowed them, and from that cloud there came the voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. God's voice is heard each time that Jesus transitions from one aspect of his life to another. This time with God's words, Jesus is prepared for the transition to go to the cross. And our Lenten journey every year, we make that journey with him, with the cross before us and the resurrection. And that's where we must worship God or worship Jesus, not at some booths where Jesus was seen in his godly glory. The question then comes to us and for my thinking here. So how does God prepare you and I for the transitions of life? I think he takes us back to our baptisms. In the waters of baptism, with the word of God, God declares us to be his own beloved children. And in that sacrament, God wraps us in his grace and love. He marks us with his own, as his own forever, marking us to the cross of Christ. And essentially, he says to us what he says to Jesus. You are my beloved child. With you, I'm well, I am well pleased. And baptism is not a magical thing that we just do once. Baptism is the, the beginning of our faith, that relationship with God. And so we practice our faith. We remember that we are baptized in every transition of our lives. That no matter what happens to us, be it good or bad, we belong to God the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when that final transition comes, the words are spoken at, the, at our funerals. These are words that we use in our liturgy. They are from Romans. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live, might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. J. Marcus writes in a commentary that I use quite often to help me understand the passages. And I'm gonna share this with you. I paraphrased a little bit of it with, so that it makes more sense. Today, we see Jesus in one way on the mountaintop as he is transfigured. But on Good Friday, we will see him differently. Here on earth, here we read of an unearthly light. But there when he is on the cross, we will find a supernatural darkness. Here Jesus' clothes become gloriously luminous in a transformation betokening messianic power. There his clothes are stripped off in an action mocking his claim to be the king of the Jews. Here we have two Old Testament saints, Moses and Elijah, who speak intimately with Jesus, thus demonstrating their identification with him. But at the cross, 
two criminals rail against him, thus demonstrating their alienation from him. And other mockers refer sarcastically to a, a godly intervention that fails to take place. Here, Peter says, it's good for us disciples to be here and proposes building booths to memorialize the event. But at the cross, the other disciples flee. And Peter, after following from a distance, ends up denying Jesus and going out, thus showing that in his eyes, it is no longer a good thing to be with Jesus. Here, God's voice booms out his commitment to his beloved son. But at the cross, God is silent. And his son pierces the air with his anguished question, why have you abandoned me? God provides us with much. And each time you are ready to take another step in life, be it receiving a diploma or starting a new job, bringing a new baby home or moving into retirement, whatever your transition may be, remember your baptism. Remember who you are in God's eyes. Remember what Jesus has done for you and be willing to pick up the, your cross to suffer for others as Jesus picked up our crosses and died for us. In all of our transitions in life, remember first that you are a child of God. And you can do that by more than just thinking about it on Sunday morning or on any, any morning, but also do your devotions and your prayers. And in so doing, then put your focus on Jesus, remembering that you belong to him. And then all through your life, as you transition, let the guidance of Jesus be, be spoken, to, follow the guidance of Jesus, and then hear the words of God as they were spoken to Jesus, but also spoken to you. You are my beloved child, with whom I am well pleased. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, merciful Father, we pray for the baptized, for all those that are marked with the cross of Christ forever, that will be attentive to your admonition to listen to your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, as he speaks to us through the Holy Word and through the sacraments. We pray for the church, for the whole Christian church on earth, that we will constantly be willing to pick up our crosses to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ around this world and to suffer with others that we may, may strengthen them and help them. We pray especially for the leaders of our own church, the Lutheran Church, Bishop Elizabeth Eaton and Bishop Lorna Hallis. We lift up before you all those who've been placed in authority over us, our president, our Congress, our governor, our legislature, all of our civil servants, that they would serve with integrity and honor, that they would have the welfare of all people in mind and that they will lead our country faithfully. We have those who we list before you from with our lips and from our hearts. We bring to you Tom Larson, Elizabeth Carlton, Pam Schmidt, Marilyn Hesch, Bob Madsen. We bring to you the people of Titanka Care Center and all those who are working in residential, residence in tough care centers. And as we always do, there are many from our hearts that we place before you. We know that your peace and that will be upon them, and we ask for your healing and relief according to your gracious will. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who's further taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we see the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with all of his favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, have a very blessed day. Remember that you are a child of God as you go about life. Celebrate Valentine's Day. May you have family or friends that you can enjoy uh, being with tonight, this day. And be safe in this cold weather. I apologize if there was any inconvenience for you. Uh, but uh, we felt that it was best uh, in the best interest of most people that we not try to have worship service this morning. But we'll look forward to being together again next week. Thank you and have a blessed day.